Dear Esther, I have lost track of how long I have been here and how many visits I have made overall. Certainly the landmarks are now so familiar to me that I have to remind myself to actually see the forms and shapes in front of me. I could stumble blind across these rocks, the edges of these precipices, without fear of missing my step and plummeting down to sea. Besides, I have always considered that if one is to fall, it is critical to keep one's eyes firmly open. There was once talk of a wind farm out here, away from the rage and the intolerance of the masses. The sea, they said, is too rough for the turbines to stand. They clearly never came here to experience the becalming for themselves. Personally, I would have supported it. Turbines would be a fitting contemporary refuge for a hermit. The revolution and the permanence. I found myself to be as featureless as this ocean, as shallow and unoccupied as this bay, a listless wreck without identification. My rocks are these bones and a careful fence to keep the precipice at bay. Shot through me caves, my forehead a mount, this aerial will transmit into me so. All over exposed, the nervous system, where Donnelly's boots and yours and mine still trample. I will carry a torch for you. I will leave it at the foot of my headstone. You will need it for the tunnels that carry me under.
reading Donnelly by the weak afternoon sunlight. He landed on the south side of the island, followed the path to the bay and climbed the mount. He did not find the caves and he did not chart the north side. I think this is why his understanding of the island is flawed, incomplete. He stood on the mount and only wondered momentarily how to descend. But then, he didn't have my reasons. When someone had died or was dying, or was so ill they gave up what little hope they could sacrifice, they cut parallel lines into the cliff, exposing the white chalk beneath. You could see them from the mainland or the fishing boats, and know to send aid or impose a cordon of protection, and wait a generation until whatever pestilence stalked the cliff paths died along with its hosts. My lines are just for this to keep any would-be rescuers at bay. The infection is not simply of the flesh. I quote directly, a motley lot with little to recommend them. I have now spent three days in their company. That is, I fear, enough for any man not born amongst them. Despite their tedious inclination to quote scripture, they seem to me the most godforsaken of all the inhabitants of the Outer Isles. Indeed, in this case, the very gravity of that term, forsaken by God, seems to find its very apex. It appears to me that Donnelly, too, found those who wander this shoreline to be adrift from any chance of redemption. Did he include himself in that, I wonder? Dear Esther, I met Paul. I made my own little pilgrimage. My Damascus, a small semi-detached on the outskirts of Wolverhampton. We drank coffee in his kitchen and tried to connect to one another. Although he knew I hadn't come in search of an apology, reason or retribution, he still spiralled in panic, thrown high and lucid by his own dented bonnet. Responsibility had made him old. Like us, he'd already passed beyond any conceivable boundary of life. I find myself increasingly unable to find that point where the hermit ends and Paul and I begin. We are woven into a sodden blanket, stuffed into the bottom of a boat to stop the leak and hold back the ocean. My neck aches from staring up at the aerial. It mirrors the dull throb in my gut where I am sure I've begun to form another stone. In my dreams, it forms into a perfect representation of Lot's wife, head over her shoulder, staring along the motorway at the approaching traffic in a vacuum of fatalistic calm. I dreamt I stood in the center of the sun and the solar radiation cooked my heart from the inside. My teeth will curl and my fingernails fall off into my pockets like loose change. If I could stomach, I'd eat, 
but all I seem capable of is salt water. With the livestock still here, I could turn feral and gorge. I'm as emaciated as a body on a slab, opened up for a premature source of death. I've rode to this island in a heart without a bottom, all the bacteria of my gut rising up to sing to me. Dear Esther, I have now driven the stretch of the M5 between Exeter and Bristol over 21 times. But although I have all the reports and all the witnesses and have cross-referenced them within a millimetre using my ordnance survey maps, I simply cannot find the location. You'd think there would be marks to serve as some evidence. It's somewhere between the turn-off for Sanford and the welcome brake services. But although I can always see it in my rearview mirror, I have as yet been unable to pull ashore. It's only at night that this place makes any sluggish effort at life. You can see the boy and the aerial. I've been taking to sleeping through the day in an attempt to resurrect myself. I can feel the last days drawing upon me. There's little point now in continuation. There must be something new to find here. Some nook or some cranny that offers a perspective worth clinging to. I've burnt my bridges. I've sunk my boats and watched them go to water. There must be a hole in the bottom of the boat. How else could new hermits have arrived?
I had kidney stones and you visited me in the hospital. After the operation, when I was still half submerged in anesthetic, your outline and your speech both blurred. Now my stones have grown into an island and made their escape, and you have been rendered opaque by the car of a drunk. Is this what Paul saw through his windscreen? Not Lot's wife looking over her shoulder, but a scar in the hillside, falling away to black forever. Come back. to climb, away from the sea and towards the center. It is a straight line to the summit, where the evening begins to coil around the aerial and squeeze the signals into early silence. The bothy squats against the mount to avoid the gaze of the aerial. I too will creep under the island like an animal and approach it from the northern shore. was constructed originally in the early 1700s. By then, shepherding had formalized into a career. The first habitual shepherd was a man called Jacobson from a lineage of migratory Scandinavians. He was not considered a man of breeding by the mainlanders. He came here every summer whilst building the bothy, hoping eventually that becoming a man of property would secure him a wife and a lineage. Donnelly records that it did not work. He caught some disease from his malcontented goats and died two years after completing it. There was no one to carve white lines into the cliff for him, either. Cormorants seen at dusk, they did not land. This house built of stone, built by a long dead shepherd. Contents, my camp bed, a stove, a table, chairs, my clothes, my books. The caves that score out the belly of this island, leaving it famished. My limbs and belly, famished. This skin, these organs, this failing eyesight. When the battery runs out in my torch, I will descend into the caves and follow only the phosphorescence home.
They found Jakobsen in early spring. The thaw had only just come. Even though he'd been dead nearly seven months, his body had been frozen right down to the nerves and had not even begun to decompose. His fingernails were raw and bitten to the quick. They found the phosphorescent moss that grows in the caves deep under the nails. Whatever he'd been doing under the island when his strength began to fail is lost. He'd struggled halfway up the cliff again, perhaps in a delirium, perhaps trying to reach the Bothy's fire before curling into a stone and expiring. Climbing down to the caves, I slipped and fell and have injured my leg. I think the femur is broken. It is clearly infected. The skin has turned a bright, tight pink and the pain is crashing in on waves, winter tides against my shoreline, drowning out the ache of my stones. I struggled back to the bothy to rest, but it has become clear that there is only one way this is likely to end. The medical supplies I looted from the trawler have suddenly found their purpose. They will keep me lucid for my final ascent. Donnelly's addiction is my one true constant. Even though I wake in false dawns and find the landscape changing, flowing inconstantly through my tears, I know his reaching is always upon me. saw him sat by the side of the road. I was waiting for you to be cut out of the wreckage. The car looked like it had been dropped from a great height. The guts of the engine spilled over the tarmac, like water underground.
In my final dream, I sat at peace with Jakobsen and watched the moon over the Sandford Junction. Goats grazed on the hard shoulder, a world gone to weed and redemption. He showed me his fever scars, and I mine, between each shoulder, the nascency of flight. When I was coming round from the operation, I remember the light they shone in my eyes to check for pupil contraction. It was like staring up at a moonlit sky from the bottom of a well. People moved at the summit, but I could not tell if you were one of them. 